Tourism. It's one of Australia's largest industries. Before COVID, it injected $152 billion into the economy annually and accounted for one in 13 jobs. After COVID is a different story. A ban on incoming international travel and repeated lockdowns of the local population have taken a toll on the Australian tourism industry. But with a massive 95% decrease in international departures since early 2020, domestic tourists have a big incentive to explore the incredible destinations and cultural experiences they have right here on their doorstep. Welcome to the Business of Tourism podcast, brought to you by the Australian Graduate School of Management at UNSW Business School. Please share, rate, review and subscribe on your favourite podcast platform. Australia is home to the oldest living culture on earth, Indigenous culture, which is central to its national identity. In this episode, we're exploring the rise of Indigenous tourism. You'll hear about how 60,000 years of continuous Indigenous culture is shaping new and exciting experiences for travellers and tourists. It's also creating huge opportunity to transform the domestic tourism market. First up, we'll be hearing from Phil Lockyer, Head of Indigenous Affairs at Tourism Australia. Phil is a proud Noongar man from Western Australia and he's speaking with Nick Wales, Senior Deputy Dean and Director at AGSM. They'll discuss the crucial role of Indigenous experiences in shaping the future of Australian tourism. We'll also take you to the AGSM New Tracks Indigenous Leaders Festival held earlier this year, where you'll hear about how a new Indigenous-led tourism initiative on Sydney Harbour is taking shape. First up, it's Phil Lockyer in conversation with Nick Wales. Enjoy listening. Phil, thank you for joining us. I thought I'd ask first about your your role at Tourism Australia, Head of Indigenous Affairs. Is it a new role? Yes, it is. Thanks, Nick, and thank you for having me on the podcast. So Tourism Australia in 2020 committed as one of our strategic pillars to be a champion for Indigenous tourism and wanted to look at reconnecting with the Reconciliation Action Plan program or RAP. And so as part of that, I was then employed in this role in February to help deliver on our RAP, um, help to develop it and also bring to life the strategic commitment around championing and advocating for Indigenous tourism. Great. Well, it's fantastic to see organisations making a commitment to that. Clearly, there's not a lot of tourism going on at the moment, but there has been significant growth in tourism and domestic tourism and, and particularly Indigenous tourism. Do you think that's something to do with the pandemic or do you think it was something driving it beforehand? Um, I think that's a contributing factor. As we know, tourism is one of our largest industries. Prior to the 2019-2020 bushfires, you know, it's worth $152 billion annually. It's one in 13 jobs. You know, every dollar spent in tourism generates 82 cents in two different parts of the economy. And Indigenous tourism, you know, has grown significantly over the last number of years. 1.4 1.4 million international tourists enjoyed an Indigenous experience in 2019, and that has grown each year. Obviously, uh, with the bushfires and then flowing into COVID, that has had an impact on the ability of international tourists to engage with Indigenous tourism experiences. But I guess what that has allowed is for, you know, domestic travellers, the Australian population who are, you know, jumping in their cars driving and seeing different parts of the country who are travelling to parts of the country they potentially haven't been to before are actually engaging and experiencing the great diversity that we have in our country in relation to Indigenous cultures. So Phil, what what do you think, so you talk about growth from an international perspective but also a domestic perspective in, you know, people being interested in an Indigenous experience as part of the tourism. What do you think is driving that? What, what do you think the big drivers are there? Well, I think that there is a sense that, you know, for Australians, there is this deep, rich culture, you know, the world's oldest living cultures, 60,000 years. And I think that, you know, a lot of Australians have felt that to connect with these experiences, you have to, you know, travel a long way to, say, NT or the Kimberley. Um, It can often, in their minds, feel like it's expensive. They don't know how to go about doing it. I think there's a real desire for 
the Australians to have a really authentic experience and just not sure how to go about doing that. So I think with, with COVID, people have, and you know, people obviously not being able to travel internationally, they've had more time to think about how do they want to invest their money. So they want to have an experience, a cultural experience different to what they normally have in this country. And the best way to do that is to engage with Indigenous culture. And so I think because they've got the money to invest in travelling in Australia at the time and that desire to do more than just, um, you know, drive up the coast, drive into the hinterland, but actually engage with a culture that they're less familiar with but is part of, you know, the Australian cultural fabric, I think has provided a real opportunity for people. So I think it's something that has always been there. There's potentially been a lack of awareness and understanding of how to connect with it, how close those cultural experiences can be and how, you know, really rewarding and immersive they can be from both an individual perspective, from a family perspective, how the experiences can really benefit, you know, all segments of the travelling market. Maybe that's a silver lining from the pandemic that, you know, Australians have discovered this fantastic culture that is here and that we're so lucky to be part of. Maybe if we just turn now to international tourism. So you, you talked about a growing interest in Indigenous experiences from international tourists. What were the impetus for that growth? For many travellers from places like Europe and the United States, they want to engage in a different cultural experience, being able to meet and engage with people who, you know, have a, a connection to culture, to country, to landscape. Many international tourists come to this country wanting to engage with nature and fauna and the beautiful landscapes that we have here. And in doing that, they really want to engage in a culture different to what they might be familiar with. And that is obviously Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, you know, in places like the Northern Territory, Western Australia, Queensland, but also we're finding, you know, more and more those experiences can be had in all parts of the country, in coast of New South Wales, in Tasmania, regional Victoria. There's just this desire for international tourists to see, you know, a part of this country that they see as being truly reflective of the landscape. It makes sense that an international tourist, that's what they would be interested in. They're going to Australia, they want to find out about another culture, but for a long time that didn't exist, you know, and there wasn't, those options weren't available what's changed in the tourism industry here that's actually cottoned on to that, that might be desirable? Um, I think obviously there's been a lot of work done over the last, say, 10 to 20 years from the state tourism offices in relation to developing product, to working in partnership with Indigenous communities, the marketing and branding of, and the stories we tell about our country, you know, has highlighted that more. But I think, you know, Indigenous people ourselves are taking real ownership of the way in which they want to build success for them individually and their communities. And tourism does provide that opportunity for a whole range of communities across the country who want to build, you know, economic opportunity. And so they've been able to potentially work in partnership with larger tourism businesses, be supported by state tourism offices to actually create opportunities for people to engage in the stories they have to tell. That's the really exciting thing about the growth of Indigenous tourism is the ability for local communities to tell their stories and engage and, and also build economic success and a base. I'm sort of interested in that, the way that an organisation like yours would work with an Indigenous tourism operator. What, what are the frameworks and the, and the support that you're providing and the industry is providing to allow that organisation to develop? Sure. Well, Tourism Australia's role is, you know, as a marketing agency, we, you know, we brand the country internationally. Over the last 18 months, we've been working domestically on a holiday here this year campaign as our umbrella campaign. And as part of that, we have an Indigenous program called Discover Aboriginal Experiences or DAE, um, which looks at a range of, you know, exceptional Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander tourism products located, you know, in destinations in all corners of the country. A lot of these operators are Indigenous, some are non-Indigenous owned, and they're really seen as some of the, the highest quality products that can provide both an immersive experience or, you know, a shorter term cultural experience on country. 
And that could be in an urban setting like Sydney or Melbourne. That could be, you know, up on the reef in North Queensland, you know, in red desert country like Central Australia, the Kimberley, Kakadu, but also in coastal areas like Margaret River, South Coast as well. So our Discover Aboriginal Experiences program is our key flagship program to support and to promote you know, a variety of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island experiences across the country. And we actually do that in partnership with the state tourism offices. Is there a way that you as an organisation can start promoting best practice or, or you know, showing people what great looks like so that the tourism operators can continue to upgrade their experience? Well, we think our Discover Aboriginal Experiences operators are the example and the benchmark of what great can look like. Obviously, there's you know a range of other really great, hundreds of great experiences as well that are not part of that program. But we think it's important, you know, in partnership with state tourism officers, who you know who do that development work, who do that marketing, who do that product identification and work with communities on developing tourism products. And our, our role is to really market that. What does tourism mean for an Indigenous community or an Indigenous entrepreneur? How, how can it be beneficial? The loss of culture has had obviously a highly significant impact on Indigenous communities across the country. So the ability for Indigenous people to be involved in tourism, if that is something that's a priority for them and their community, then it actually creates that strengthening of culture, connection with non-Indigenous people, the ability for non-Indigenous people to better understand the history of this landscape, the 60,000 years of this country, and the jobs that are created for older people, younger people, to really be involved in an industry which is growing and where there is high demand for authentic and often immersive Indigenous experiences. So it's growing each year, but the benefit to communities I think often can be immeasurable because obviously it's not just the economic impact, it's the cultural impact of a mental health impact of being able to share stories, share culture and have, you know, an economic future. I think the way you talk about how the economic and the cultural benefits intertwine, I I think that's a really powerful message. So we know in, in the past there has been some criticisms of exploiting Indigenous culture but not actually including Indigenous people. It feels to me that what's going on now in tourism is very different to that, that there are Indigenous people involved, that there's a real change in attitude. Is that your experience? Well, I think what's important is that the consumer and the travelling consumer, you know, knows when they're not getting a fair dinkum authentic experience. So I think often the marketplace can decide that. But I think obviously in terms of, say, you know, Indigenous art and the sale of Indigenous art, you know, there have been, you know, legislation by government, you know, the last number of years to help try and rectify that. But I think what's important is when Indigenous people have a level of control, whether they're the the business owner themselves or they form really um, important, meaningful partnerships with, let's say, larger tour organisations, then that's when I think we're getting the best outcomes and the best product for travellers to engage with. And so I think that kind of speaks to itself in terms of what travellers then engage with. I think there's potentially going to be experiences that are potentially not as authentic as others. But I think that because there's been such a growth in really immersive, really authentic and high quality Indigenous experiences, that that's where the market goes. You've talked a lot about the immersive experiences and the growth of immersive experiences in tourism. I wonder if you could think of an example that illustrates the, you know, what what is one of those great immersive experiences? Sure. I mean, a couple would be um, down in the New South Wales south coast on Ewan country, um, just past around Nara. You've got Nara Nara Cultural Awareness run by a great guy, Dwayne Bannon Harrison, and he runs a, a couple of night immersive experience of their own country, you know, learning about Yuan culture. And I think the great thing about this, this experience is that it's only a few hours from Sydney. It's a coastal community. It's a, a region that's, that's got a really strong connection to, you know, local Yuan culture and language. Um, so that would be one. 
in Tasmania, in out of Launceston on Luchawina country, is Wukalina Walk, which is a three-day immersive experience where you're walking on country. I mean, we know Tasmania has got lots of great hikes and walks, and here is one where you, you can do, led by Palawa guides, traditional owners, over country for a number of days. So they're two really great, you know, immersive experiences. But then again, you can also have, you know, great cultural tours in Sydney and in Melbourne, you know, in places like Port Stephens, north of Newcastle. You can be involved in great uh, sand dune adventures where you're on Waramai country on quad bikes learning about culture. You know, up on Gumbangia country in Coffs Harbour with Wajana Yam and you've got paddle boarding where you can spend half a day paddle boarding through Coffs Harbour, through the waterways, learning about Gumbangyere country. And also similar up at um, Cookie Allergy country, up in the Daintree rainforest with Walkabout Adventures and Wan Walker, where you're, you know, out in the mangroves, where you're hunting for, for crabs, you know, learning about Cookie Allergy language. And that's a, the type of experience which is different up in the Daintree out of Port Douglas than you potentially would have from a, a non-Indigenous tour operator. Obviously, there's also some really amazing immersive experiences you can have up in the Kimberley region of Western Australia, and obviously, as we know, in, in, in Northern Territory, whether it's Nipmuluk Tours in Catherine, Sea Link Tours um, going to Tiwi Islands, um, which is a great day tour, and a number of companies that go out to Kakadu. And, you know, also great, some great ones over in Western Australia as well, um, around kind of Shark Bay and up in, you know, Nararanga tours up in um, the Pilbara region. So I think, you know, these immersive experiences, whether they're a day or whether they're a couple of nights, can be had in all corners of the country. And, you know, they can be kind of action-oriented, aquatic, or they can be kind of sitting and listening. You must sort of feel, you know, very happy to be in this role now, Phil. You know, what I'm really passionate about and what I think is exciting and what we're going to see um, over the next kind of 12 to 18 months differently is the way in which we talk about this country. You know, the great role that we play at Tourism Australia is, you know, I like to say we're the big cheerleader for this country. We've got a big megaphone when talking to people overseas around why this country is such an amazing country for people to come and visit, to people to come and come and stay with us, for us to, to share and enjoy. But I have felt that, you know, we haven't necessarily spoken to the, the depth of diversity and to the warmth and to the humour and to the sense of, of, of community and trust that the Indigenous experience and 60,000 years of culture can provide. And so that's what we have been doing. Um, and, you know, we've been doing for a couple of years through our Discover Exp Aboriginal Experiences program, but being able to speak internationally to the depth of diversity of this country, I think is really exciting. And I think that just very exciting to hear you say that. And um, But also this ability of Indigenous tourism operators to tell stories and to tell stories about their country and about their history and also about the recent history of Australia. Tell me about why that's so important, being able to tell a story about tradition, but also now. Well, you know, I think, you know, Reconciliation Australia does a barometer each year. And one of the questions they ask is around, you know, are you proud of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures? And I think last year, 64% of the general community said they were, and that increases each year. So I think there's this sense that non-Indigenous Australians, so whitefellas in this country want to feel that we are connected and we are reconciled in a way that can help overcome the challenges of the past. So that can be a healing process for all of us. You know, many non-Indigenous people don't have personal connections with Indigenous people. So being able to engage in a tourism experience, which helps better understand their country. And if, you know, engaged in an experience that is potentially somewhere where they live, then they're getting a better sense of their sense of place and their sense of connection to what this country is about. You know, most Australians live in large urban settings on the coasts, mostly in the southeast corner. We know it's a big, big country with lots of beautiful, diverse landscape. And I think there's a real desire and yearning for non-Indigenous Australians to get out there and engage with it um, in all of its forms, in all of its glory, and being able to sit there and have a yarn with traditional owners, cultural custodians, the holders of knowledge in all corners of the country, I think really connects non-Indigenous Australians 
to this country and to this landscape in a way that I think, you know, most people in this country are really yearning for. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. You talked about your role being developed as part of the Reconciliation Action Plan of Tourism Australia, and it seems that the organisation's made a significant commitment. But you've, you've been around and you've been observing Reconciliation Action Plans for a while. What's your view of them and how are they working and you know, what, are, what are the challenges around, around that process? Well, yes, thanks, Nick. Yes, I mean, I've been involved in, in with, with the RAP program, both at my previous roles at IAG and Commonwealth Bank, and I think they're deeply meaningful. I think when an organisation commits to a RAP, what they're doing is saying, these are the things we want to do to engage our business with Indigenous people, Indigenous communities. And we're going to do this both in partnership, in collaboration, and to the benefit of Indigenous communities, but also we're going to do it because we see the value it brings to both our business, to our employees, and to the country as a whole, and our community. And so when an organisation is at its best with the RAP program, then I think it's delivering real outcomes. I think there's been about 1,200 RAPs delivered over the last 20 or so years, many of them around education, employment. I think the growth we are seeing in Indigenous enterprise, Indigenous businesses, I think the RAP program is a real benefit to that. The greater connection point, greater understanding that non-Indigenous people have with 60,000 years of culture, the RAP program I think is a component of that. So I think it's greatly beneficial. Obviously, like anything, a RAP is only as good as the passion and the commitment of the organisation that's delivering on it. So I think, you know, you've also got to be true to the values of what you're trying to achieve as a business and what you're trying to achieve in partnership with the Indigenous community. What can the tourism industry do in general to help Indigenous people create effective tourism businesses? Do you think, do you think there's a role for the industry as a whole to start building that capability? I think definitely, Nick, and I think, you know, the tourism industry, to be fair, is probably a little bit behind some other industries in terms of partnering with Indigenous communities. Obviously, some businesses have been doing some great work, but I think it's about where that tourism business operates. You know, they could operate in in a specific part of the country. How can they then build links in with that community? How can they build partnerships with that community? And what's really important is being able to have a conversation about the needs of that community, the aspirations of that community and what they want. And then through that conversation and that process, potentially identify where there could be a tourism lens, which a business can involve themselves in. I think potentially often businesses, and it's not just tourism, talk to Indigenous people, businesses and communities and go, this is what we're looking for, can you help us? as opposed to really understanding the needs of that community and building trust with that community and those individuals and then identifying from there what might flow from there. Because when you can build that trust, build those relationships, you know, sit down, have a yarn, understand who they are, what their motivations are, you know, you being able to share that, then you're going to build something far more meaningful and far more authentic and far more based on joint aspirations and needs. You know, not every Indigenous person, Indigenous community wants to work in tourism. You know, they have other goals, aspirations. There are some stories, there are some places that are too sacred to share, and that's fine as well. I wonder if I could ask you to sort of look ahead five years from now and think, what do you think that will look like and what are you excited about? Well, in five years, I'll be excited because, you know, we're going to have more international tourists coming into this country from all all our markets um, and going, we've booked an Indigenous cultural experience and they're doing that in all corners of the country. That's, That's the outcome, you know, I think we all want to see. We want to see people coming in and doing the Opera House and doing the great sporting and and cultural events, going up to the Daintree and not just going to Uluru and Kakadu, but doing cultural experiences in all corners of the country Um, and seeing it as a great thing to do within their itinerary and that it becomes a really standard thing. And also for more Australians to be engaged in connecting with an Indigenous experience, potentially close to where they live or in the state where they live, and whether that's a jump in the car and go for a drive for a day or jumping in a plane and having, you know, an immersive experience in a different part of a country. So that increase, I think, is almost a given over the next five years. And then whenever anyone is seeing marketing or branding, 
in every corner of the world on this country, they know that there are a diverse range of experiences to engage with with the world's oldest living culture. That sounds like a really exciting future. Phil, it's been a really interesting conversation. Thank, thank you so much for your time. And I encourage everybody listening to this to go out and look for immersive, authentic Indigenous experience for your next holiday. It just sounds like a wonderful thing to do. So, Phil, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick, for your time. And thank you for inviting me. So now we've heard about some of the custom tourism experiences built and designed by Indigenous people and communities. How can industry bodies or tourism-adjacent organisations work to support them? The story that you are about to hear is a story of a community coming together to bring Sydney Harbour's rich Indigenous history to life through a new tourism venture. Once the pride of Sydney Ferries fleet, the Lady Northcote was destined for the scrapyard, but then Transport New South Wales' Mark Champley, in collaboration with Indigenous-led community organisation Tribal Warrior, saw the potential for the ship's second life as an Indigenous tourism experience at sea. Let's go to the 2021 New Tracks Indigenous Leaders Festival and hear from Camilleroy man Mark Champley on the journey of the Lady Northcote Ferry. On the 5th of January 1975, a disaster happened in Hobart, Tasmania. And this disaster had a direct result on the Sydney Ferries fleet. I'm Mark Champley and I'm going to tell you the journey of the Lady Northcote. Back in uh, January 1975, a freighter hit the Tasman Bridge in Hobart, Tasmania, causing it to partially collapse and uh, kill 12 people. Uh, uh, Seven people were crew members and uh, four vehicles with five people inside fell 45 metres to their death. This also disconnected the eastern suburbs of Hobart to, to the town city of Hobart and caused a number of social issues. Uh, because the bridge was going to be closed for quite an amount of time, there was a, a request put out to the nation, does anyone have any uh, ferries that are available? And New South Wales sent down two ferries, uh, the Kosciuszko and the Lady Wakehurst. The Lady Wakehurst was the sister vessel to the Lady Northcott. The Lady Northcott at the time was still in the shipyard up at Newcastle, but because the Lady Wakehurst was on the Manly Ferry route, there was an issue with that. So they released the Lady Northcott from Newcastle, brought it down to Sydney in 1975 and began its, its first voyage as the Manly Ferry Service. It remained there until 1977 when the Wakehurst returned uh, to service and replaced the Lady Northcott on the Manly Ferry Run. In 1977, the Lady Northcott then became a ferry for the Inner Harbour, doing the Mossman, Neutral Bay, Taronga Zoo runs, sometimes out to Balmain. It was used for the uh, morning and afternoon harbour cruises, uh, some charter vessels at night as well, and also backed up the Manly Ferry service. So when there was a breakdown, a ferry needed to go for fuel, perhaps, or drills, the Lady Northcott would replace that. So it was a very versatile uh, ferry. In 1988, I joined Sydney Ferries and started my career there after two years in the Merchant Navy. When I arrived, I was really surprised to, to hear that there was, had never been an Aboriginal engineer or master, skipper, at Sydney Ferries in its almost 125 years. And there really were very uh, few Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander deckhands as well. Then, in the 80s and 90s, some other vessels came into service leading up to the year 2000 Olympic Games. A number of the lady class vessels were retired. Many of them were just uh, broken up into scrap. The last two ferries surviving was the Lady Heron and the Lady uh, Northcon. In 2017, the Lady Northcott had its last ferry uh, service from Manly to Circular Quay. After that journey, it was then retired to Balmain Shipyard. In uh, 2015, I left Sydney Ferries 
after a, a long career there. I'm really proud to say when I left, the, there were 5% of the workforce were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. And for the very first time, the, the ferries were flying um, Aboriginal flags during NAIDOC week. So I really feel like I made a difference, but unfortunately there still wasn't an Aboriginal master or skipper within the business. Fast forward to 2019, Transport released its first reconciliation action plan. It was a wonderful event. We launched it up at Newcastle, but there was some really hard commitments. And then the, our Aboriginal community within Transport were out thinking of what we can do to support our RAP. I was on the Reconciliation Advisory Committee and I built strong relationships with a, a number of senior leaders, including the then Secretary of Transport, Rod Staples. So what happened in 2019, I was just walking through my home and I could, I, by pure chance, and I know the ancestral spirits were guiding me, on the news they were showing the Lady Northcott being towed out of Sydney Harbour um, up to Newcastle. So when I saw that, I went straight to the computer and I sent a long email off to Rod Staples, giving him the history of, of um, the Lady Northcott and how two years prior I did raise this with the, with the Depth Secretary asking if Transport would consider giving it to a uh, Tribal Warrior. But at the time we didn't have a wrap and I don't think there was really a lot of appetite, but times changed. We now, now had a wrap and we had strong commitment from our leadership but also our Aboriginal leadership within Transport. Uh, Rod Staples agreed. That takes us up to where we are but I wanted to share with you, in the same year, 2019, Sydney Ferries had its first Aboriginal engineer and skipper in over 150 years. So that tells me that things are changing. Now that Lady Northcote has made her journey to Tribal Warrior, what does the group plan to do to transform her into an Indigenous cultural experience at sea? Shane Phillips, highly respected Aboriginal leader and CEO of Tribal Warrior, spoke with the New Tracks audience of his vision for Lady Northcote's future under her new identity, Wirrawee. We are going to turn that to an iconic looking vessel. The general sightseeing tour, two hours around the harbour, leaving from Circular Quay and Darling Harbour two most frequented places for, for tourists, and we'll do the two-hour cruise around the foreshore. But if you want to pay the premium, you go upstairs, we're going to do an augmented reality version where people can see the landscape and the stories that people can talk about around the foreshore. We want it to be a cultural centre as well, to, so it has something that's there. If you get a charter where there's, um, there's, char there's catering and stuff, it gives us some room. I'm there, um, you know, we'll have Five or six staff, five or six families that get opportunity to work on a vessel, an iconic vessel. We've got families around there and the ferries all around that are working on the harbour as well, which we rotate through our shifts as well. We're going to dual name it, where are we? Girl, a local dialect. Um, and we're going to, this artwork's going to be a wrap that's going to go on it. So there's a few versions of how we're going to, what we've got of it, but definitely up the upper deck is going to do something which is completely unique. The iconic painting, where like everyone said to us, let's get some amazing artists to do it. We, we said, all right, we'll get a local artist, but we're going to get the kids to be part of that artwork. This is just a, something we looked at, and we know that 2,000 schools in Sydney Basin alone, um, and in the curriculum, they're meant to um, do some stuff, and we tell a story, a unique story on Sydney Harbour about its, the foreshore, who was there also, what the places where the iconic places are, like the Opera House, Jabal Gully, they, there's... It's amazing stories there, and it's all connected to their curriculum. So we're thinking, if we can take 10% of that market, that really has the chance to help us. Um, we think that business can work. That's not even including the actual charters. Uh, and I'll tell you now, charters are where sort of the, a lot of the fat are in, in the business for us. So, so in the maritime ministry, we've, you know, we've trained over 3,000 crew, and lots of them are working in, in places all around the country. But here, we've got... There's a big community mob out there working on the harbour. And we want to do something that's going to bring everyone together as well. I think it's really important. 
when we're out there, we want to make sure people all feel part of something and everyone knows that we're all welcoming and we're making sure that they know how proud we are of our people because um, all the families that come through and learn about all the culture stuff. I guess what we do, what we do, that fam the, the mentoring part of it, the mentoring part is the why. The commercial arm of that, that's, that's what we do, but this is the reason why we're doing it. It's about getting our young ones focused on rebuilding themselves and families connecting themselves culturally. The Lady Northcote gives tribal warrior significant opportunities to expand its reach in the community as a domestic tourism operator. What a fantastic story to round out this episode on the business of tourism. To find out more about today's episode, search for AGSM's The Business Of podcast online. Please share, rate and review and subscribe to AGSM's business podcast on your favourite platform and look out for future episodes. In the meantime, you can follow AGSM at UNSW Business School on LinkedIn and Facebook for more industry insights for an accelerating world. Or find us at agsm.edu.au. Until next time, thank you for listening.